Good morning. We're going to begin our worship today by asking our God to tune our hearts to sing his praise. Come thou fount of every blessing. Let's sing it together. Sunday evening, uh, in our sing along time that we had last Sunday evening, I was talking about worship, and I said that worship is a realignment of our relationship with our God. And the reason that that is so important, and it's so important that that be a consistent part of our worship, is because in the words of our song that we just sang, our hearts are prone to wander. We are prone to leave the God that we love. And, um, you know, I've been thinking about this a little bit this week. I, I want to be transparent with you. I had to do some soul searching in my life uh, this week. I think that that can be especially true at times like we are going through right now in our country and in our world. Uh, and I think our thinking can go a little bit like, you know, things are so terrible right now, I deserve this, you know. And so we, we give ourselves a pass maybe for, for wasting time or, or for uh, not having self-control in certain areas that we should have or for being unkind to our families. You know, that can, can be a big one right now. Um, or, or for having a critical or complaining spirit. And as I said, you know, I, I was struggling with some of those things this past week and I had to make those things, those things right. And so uh, I'd like us to sing this next song on the off chance um, that maybe I might not be the only one who's carnal enough to need that. Um, as we sing this next song, I'd really like to sing it as a prayer. And I'd like us to use this time for self-examination in our, in our lives and in our hearts. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Oh, 
ask our God uh, to cleanse our hearts and to forgive us of our sin, he does that. He washes us whiter than snow, and he does that at salvation. When we place our faith in Christ, if we are in Christ, Christ has taken upon himself the penalty for our sin, and he has given to us his righteousness. Uh, our next song uses the analogy of robes to communicate that truth, that Christ has taken upon himself our filthy robes of sin, and he's given to us his spotless robes of righteousness so that now when God sees us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of his son. And because of that, we have eternal life. And eternal life is not something that we get after we pass away someday. It's something that we have right now in our hearts because at the moment of salvation, Christ gives to us his Holy Spirit, which the Bible calls a spring of living water, springing up to everlasting life. We're going to sing the song, His Robes for Mine, and then the song, Living Waters. Let's go. 
Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Wes, and the rest of our musicians. It is our prayer that through the virtual uh, time that we're having during this, this uh, pandemic, that we'll be able to turn our hearts towards the Lord through our music and through the preaching to follow. Let's take just a moment for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for our time this morning. We thank you for our musicians who have uh, helped us in our worship this morning. We do pray that, as, as Pastor Wes mentioned earlier, that we are prone to wander. And we, Lord, we pray that we will each be able to do some self-examination and to be able to turn our hearts to you. We thank you for this morning, for the music, for the preaching to follow. Lord, we pray that all that we do, we will honor and glorify you. And Lord, that we will be able to worship together, even though we're in our own homes, that we will be able to join our hearts together as we worship you this morning. Again, we just thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One of the things that is so fulfilling for me as a music pastor is encouraging our members uh, to use their giftedness to minister to our body. And, uh, and we have some incredibly talented musicians here that it is my privilege to work with every week. And God has given us a few really talented songwriters here as well at Grace. And one of those is Rachel Harris. And uh, Rachel approached me a few months ago about writing a song for our church. And of course, I, th I told her I thought that was a fantastic idea. And so we started to talk about maybe what the theme of the song should be. And um, and we wanted it to kind of go along with pastor's messages, but then when, when COVID-19 hit, uh, I wasn't sure from month to month where pastor would be going with his messages, but I, I told Rachel, I said, you know, I think one thing that we could all use right now uh, would just be a very comforting song of God's peace. And as it happened, she had already been thinking along those lines, and she already had some ideas about that. And so she's going to sing her new song for us right now. And, and I want you to listen as she sings. Later, when we meet together as a congregation, uh, we're all going to learn this and sing this together. But right now, I'd like you to listen as she sings, Speak Peace.
Thank you, Rachel. We appreciate your ministering to us this morning. What a beautiful song. And uh, we do thank the Lord for your giftedness and being able to, to write that for us and share that with us this morning. I want to welcome you once again. I know Pastor Brian already uh, welcomed you to our uh, virtual worship service this morning, but I also want to welcome you and thank you for being with us today. Just a couple of quick comments and things to just keep in mind as we are moving forward as a church family. Uh, first of all, you've probably heard by now that the governor has extended our stay at home order until May the 8th. And so we will continue to monitor that. And, and as we move through the phases of reopening our economy and reopening our, our community, and certainly that includes our church, and we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, but we certainly want to make sure that we are um, praying about that and also just uh, working together as a community here to make sure that we keep everybody healthy and safe. And we will keep you posted as, as we move forward. Also, just, uh, just so you know, this will be our only post today, and uh, we hope that you're encouraged this morning with our, with our worship. I also want to, once again, just, uh, I am blown away by the giving, and I just want to, again, thank you from the bottom of my heart just for your commitment to financially supporting our church and supporting our ministry, and let me encourage you to please keep doing that as you're able and as the Lord allows you to give. We certainly uh, encourage you to do that, and I just thank you for your generosity. If you are watching today and maybe you're new to Grace or maybe you'd like to, to help us out financially so we can continue our ministry here, you can go to our website, gracenc.org, and you're able to give online. And uh, that's the easiest way for you to do that. If you would prefer to, to, to mail in your support, you can mail it into our church. And we are still able to process that and take care of that. And that certainly will get to where it needs to go as well. But again, I, I am just so thankful for your faithful support here at, at Grace Baptist Church. Look forward to studying scripture with you this morning. And Pastor West mentioned uh, right before Rachel sang that um, she had come to him and expressed this desire to share this song with our with our congregation and, and write that song. And it's interesting because I had been thinking over the last couple of days about one of the highlights for me as a pastor is to see someone will come to me, and this has happened multiple times through the years, where someone comes and they have an idea about ministry, something that they want to begin, something that they are burdened for and impassioned about, and they share that, and that we then have an opportunity to engage in that ministry. Now, there, there are certainly times that uh, that is not possible. There are times for whatever reason that uh, we can't maybe carry out a particular request. But on those occasions, when we are able to do that, it brings great joy to us as pastors to be able to implement ministry that people have a burden for. You know, over the last couple of weeks, I, I've been thinking a lot about the Psalms. And, and Pastor West mentioned that uh, he has been doing soul searching um, in his own life, and I have as well. And I think in these moments where we are we are um, hitting hitting the the pause button, so to speak, and we are kind of resetting our norm and what all this means, that if, if you're like me, you've had more time to just think and contemplate about what God is doing in my own personal life. And whenever I am doing that, I'm going through that process, I inevitably end up in the Psalms. And so today I want to share Psalm 86 with you. So if you have a Bible, I would invite you to find that in your, in your copy of Scripture. We're going to be looking at, Lord willing, the entire Psalm today and studying it together. And uh, as we do that, I want to draw your attention uh, first to just some highlights about this psalm. Maybe it's a psalm that you are not familiar with. This is a psalm of David. 
And interestingly enough, it falls in the Psalter right in the middle of uh, several uh, psalms by, uh, uh, by Korah. And uh, we have this psalm here by David. You also, as we work through it, you're going to see a number of very familiar expressions that you see throughout the psalms, but you also see it in other places in, um, in, in the Old Testament. But what is interesting about Psalm 86 and what drew my attention to it is it is filled with petitions. It is filled with David pouring out his heart to his God and making requests of him. In fact, if, if my counting is correct, there's at least 15 of them. And there are 15 times at least that David is making his requests known to the Lord. And take my opening comments about uh, just as a pastor, having people make a request and you have the ability to grant that request. Maybe as a parent, sometimes your kids come to you and they make a request and it brings you joy as a father, brings you joy as a, as a pastor, as a leader, be able to answer someone's petition. And so part of the reason this psalm caught my attention is I, I can't help but imagine how wonderful it is to our Heavenly Father when His children come to Him in transparency and authentic, with an authentic heart and just pouring out our souls before the Lord and bringing our requests before Him. Now, as you're going to see in just a moment, as is the case with so many of the psalms, David is facing a time of challenge. And, you know, I'm not going to get into this this morning, but just an aside thought on that. Times of crisis always force us to make decisions. It, it presses us into the place where we are going to have to make some sort of decision. We're going to run somewhere. We're going to go to someone or something to get through that time of crisis. And here, David, in this time of weakness, he is going to go to his creator. And so my question for you as we begin is where do you run in your times of weakness and need and crisis? Where do you go? And this morning, we want to talk about the fact that in times of our, in times of need, in times of our weaknesses, we can always bring our petitions before our Heavenly Father, and it's not a burden to Him. It is what He would want His children to do is to come to Him. So we're going to look at this psalm in three sections, and what I have done is I've broken this down into three general petitions that David makes to God. And so let's begin by reading in, in verse number one of Psalm 86. You see, first of all, the heading. It tells us this is a prayer. Okay, so notice that this is a designated prayer, a petition, a plea before God, a prayer of David. David begins, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. David recognized his weakness. He recognized his vulnerability when he says, I am poor and weak, weak verse, uh, uh, and, and needy. Verse two, preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. And verse 6 is the reason I wanted to present this psalm to you today. Verse 6, give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. And then notice verse seven, in the day of my trouble, I call upon you for you answer me. What a tremendous opening to this psalm. So I want you to notice with me this first petition that David makes is David pleased with the Lord for mercy and grace. As I mentioned in, in verse number one, David recognizes his need. He recognizes his 
vulnerability. He recognizes his weakness. Now, what is interesting to me is the contrast almost happens in verse two. David makes this statement of vulnerability. And then in verse two, he prays, God, preserve me. And then he says, why? Well, because I am godly. Now that may strike you as interesting. David isn't being egotistical when he says this. He's not being arrogant, but he is declaring before God of his commitment to the Lord and his desire to serve God. I, when I was reading through this many, many times this week, I had to stop and pause and ask myself the question, am I bold enough to go before the throne of God and say, preserve me because I am godly? Is that a, a true statement for you? Is that a true statement for me? Not that we are perfectly holy or perfectly godly. We certainly know that that isn't true. But is my heart's desire to serve God? David recognized his place of neediness, but he also recognizes he was one that desired to serve God. Notice another description that he uses of himself in verse two. He says, preserve me for I am godly, save me, rescue me because I am your servant. I am a servant. I, I don't have any rights of my own. I don't have any power in and of myself. David is saying, I am the servant and you, O Lord, are my mighty God. And he says at the end of verse two, I trust in you and you are my God. Now in verses three and four, David continues to pour out his soul. The beginning of verse three, that very first phrase, God, be gracious to me. This plea to the Lord for grace. And notice how often David is making this petition before God. He says, all day long, I am crying to you. This plea for grace and mercy, it wasn't stated one time. It was this repetitive request and petition that David was making before the Lord and calling out to God as one of his children, one who desired to be godly, one who desired to be a servant of the Lord. And he says, Lord, I need your graciousness. And notice what he says in verse four. He says in the very beginning of that verse, gladden the soul of your servant. Basically, that phrase is bring joy to my soul. He says in verse four, I am lifting up my soul to you. I am bringing my burdens before you. Lord, please gladden my heart. Verse five, we have this this uh, bold statement that David understood that God was gracious and he was good, he was forgiving, and he was a loving God. And then that brings me to verses six and seven that I'm drawing this first main petition from that David is pleading with the Lord for grace. Now, depending on what version of the English Bible you may be looking at this morning, I want to just highlight the word that the ESV translates at the end of verse 6, this plea for grace. I want to highlight this word just for a moment. The Hebrew word behind the translation here of grace, it, is a sub, it means a supplication for favor that David is bringing this supplication, this prayer, God, please give me your favor. And what the English translations have done, the NIV, for instance, translates that last phrase as listen to my cry for mercy. In the, in the, in the New American, American Standard, it, it highlights it as, the, it translates it this way, my, the voice of my supplications, my call for favor. And the Holman, again, this plea for mercy. That is why the, 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 the main petition, if you will, the main prayer, the main plea that God is bringing, or the, excuse me, David is bringing before his God is this plea for grace and for mercy. David could only experience a true relationship with God if he was the recipient of God's grace, if he was the recipient of of God's mercy. In fact, I would say there is no greater need for a sinful man 
than the grace and mercy of God. The great Spurgeon said once, he said, the best of men need mercy, an appeal to mercy, yea, to nothing else but mercy. Here's the reality. Like David, we are weak and needy. Just like David, we have weaknesses, we have vulnerabilities. And whether or not we want to admit it or not, like David, we are weak, needy sinners. That it is only because of the Father's love for us, it is only because of His grace that we can go boldly before Him and plead with Him for grace and mercy. That's why verse 5 is so important that God is forgiving, He is abounding in love, and He loves to hear His children call to Him and make petitions to Him and pray to Him in their time of need. Now, let's, hit, let's pause here just for a moment before we go any further in this psalm. Because as I mentioned, when I read through it, verse six is what caught my attention in this psalm. Because when David says, I am pleading for grace, I am pleading for mercy. As I have been kind of assessing my own soul during this, during this time of social distancing, this time of not being able to, to meet like we normally would, I have been reminded powerfully of my daily need of God's grace. I need God's mercy. You're probably like me, and every single day I am reminded of my strong propensity to sin. And yet I am so thankful that God's propensity to forgive, God's propensity to love, and God's propensity to give grace and mercy is even greater than my tendency towards sinfulness. Think about this for a moment. You may be wondering what areas in our lives do we need God's grace? Well, let me give you a few of them. First, we need God's grace for redemption. In fact, in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians tells us very bluntly that by, but God is rich in mercy because he loved us, that we are able to, by his mercy, experience salvation. In Ephesians 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that it is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God that none of us could experience redemption apart from the grace and mercy of a holy and righteous God. Now, closely connected to that, a second area that we need grace in is we need it for redemption, but closely associated with that is we need God's grace for forgiveness. In Colossians chapter one, again, the apostle Paul writing, he says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. And Paul adds this phrase, the forgiveness of sins. Now you may be watching today, maybe you're not a, a Christian, maybe you're not sure what redemption is really about, how, you don't, you're not really sure how one enters into a personal relationship with God, or maybe you are a believer and you have forgotten what God has forgiven you from. And I would argue that even a very superficial reading of the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount are clear reminders of how sinful we truly are and how prone we are to breaking the law of God. In our family devotions the other day, um, one of the devotions was talking about the fact that as New Testament believers, we are not under the Old Testament law. And my daughter said very boldly, well, I'm so glad that we're not under the law. My youngest son got up and ran out of the room, which was an interesting moment in the fact that we were doing family devotions, getting ready to have a, a word of prayer. He runs from the room and, and I hear him messing around in the other room. And then he comes back with a sheet of paper on which he had wrote law, the word law, L-A-W, and held it over my daughter's head and said, you are under the law. 
It took my daughter a few minutes to figure out what he was doing since she couldn't see the law over her head. And I was thinking about that. We were, we are as, as believers because of the Old Testament law that we are not bound to the Mosaic law, but the Mosaic law was given to show us our sinfulness, that we are sinners without hope of redemption, apart from the forgiveness of sin that is only found in Christ alone. And it's by faith that we have forgiveness. It is by faith that we experience redemption. It is only by the grace of God that you are saved. Paul says in Ephesians 2, it is not by our works of righteousness. We can't earn it. It is only by God's grace. If you're not sure you're a Christian this morning, I want you to think about the realities of how sinful we really are. And sometimes as believers, I fear that we generalize sin, something like this. We say, well, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, we know that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Take those verses, however, and personalize them. Maybe you would say something like this. My heart is desperately wicked and deceptive. My heart. I have sinned egregiously, horribly against a holy God. I have come woefully short of the glory of God. Therefore, I deserve God's judgment. Put yourself in those statements. That's what we are. The law, the Mosaic law showed us our sinfulness. We could not save ourselves apart from the grace and mercy of God. In fact, John says it this way, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My dear friend, when is the last time you have taken some moments and some time in your life and contemplated and dwelt upon the grace of God when it comes to redemption and it comes to the forgiveness of sin? That ought to bring joy to our heart. In fact, David says in this psalm, when he says, Lord, please gladden my soul, that alone should bring joy to our hearts, knowing God's forgiveness and God's redemption. It's not based on our goodness and on what we do. It's based on who God is, and it's by his grace. So we need God's grace for redemption. We need God's grace for forgiveness. A couple of others, just very quickly, we need God's grace for strength. 2 Timothy 2.1, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We need God's grace for comfort, that God is a God of all comfort, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1. We need God's grace for perseverance, pressing forward, continuing on even in our weaknesses, and we need God's grace for uh, guidance. In fact, in Psalm 32, I, I would just read this verse quickly to you. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. We are in desperate need of God's grace. We are in desperate need of God's mercy. And so David begins this psalm with with a plea to the Lord, a petition, a supplication to the Lord for favor that was unmerited, undeserved, but it was based on God's love. That is an amazing truth. I want you to notice David's second plea or David's second petition. It's found in verses 8 through 13. I want you to notice that David also makes a petition Uh, for instruction. Notice verse 8. David says, there is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. Listen to this next phrase. You alone are God. Now, before we get to the petition, Notice, first of all, David's recognition of who God was, the sovereign God of this world, the king of all 
all nations, the only God, the one true God. There was no other God who was deserving of David's worship. And David understands that in verse uh, 10, that you alone are God. David's loyalty was undivided toward God. Now, if there was a multiplicity of gods, if there was a plurality of gods, we could have divided hearts and give some loyalty to this God or to that God. And that was certainly true in David's day for those that were pagans and following uh, following after false gods and, and worshiping this God and that God, trying to earn favor from this deity and that deity. And they were torn. They were divided in their allegiance. God, David says, God, you alone are God. There is no other God. And so, Lord, I am coming before you, before you, the king of all nations, the God who has done wondrous things. And then verse 11, we get David's petition. David pe- pleads with the Lord, makes this prayer to the Lord. Verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord that I may walk in your truth, unite my heart to fear in your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. And then notice verse 13, for great is your steadfast love to me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Now we see here that David understands that while he is committed to God, he continues to need instruction from the Lord. He continues to have the Lord use his word in his heart because David was still like the rest of us, prone to wander, prone to walk away from the Lord. David understood that his heart was fickle and that there were times that he was in need of God redirecting him. Now, let's pause here for just a moment. David, which we haven't gotten this far yet, we'll we'll in the next section, but in verse 14, when we get there in just a moment, in verse 14, we find out that David is facing a crisis. David is facing hardship. He's facing opposition. He's facing difficulty. Now, what do you normally pray when you are in a time of crisis? What do you pray when you are being uh, ridiculed or attacked or you're facing some kind of hardship? Normally, what we pray for is deliverance. God, get me out of this situation. Lord, deliver me from my accusers. Lord, deliver me from this hardship. Deliver me from this crisis. God, I just want out. That's not what David prays for. Instead, David says, Lord, I need you to instruct me. I need you to teach me. And David, while he was a servant of the Lord, while he had the the, the confidence in a sense of his relationship with God that he could say all the way back in verse two, that I am godly, he still understood that he had a propensity to wander away from the Lord. He had a tendency to become complacent. He had a tendency to neglect his heavenly father. And so he prayed, Lord, please teach me. You know, I I don't know what the Lord is doing in, in your particular heart during this time, but I do pray that our, our ultimate prayer is not just Lord, deliver us from this problem so that we can go back to life as normal. I hope we're praying rather, Lord, instruct me so that as I move on with my life, I won't go back to what I was. I will take another step of obedience to you. There are blessings in every crisis. There are things that come up in every crisis that God uses to instruct us and to teach us and to help us to learn in these times when we are being pressed and we are being Um, uh, 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 pushed upon by hardship that we like David should be praying, Lord, please teach me. Please instruct me because I need to learn. When we're overwhelmed and we feel life pressing upon us, we often forget that God is still the king of this world, that he is still the ruler of all nations 
And we at times forget that God is still ruling and reigning and none of these circumstances are taking the Lord by surprise. And so pray to him, not just for deliverance, not that we're wrong to pray for that, but more specifically, Lord, instruct me, teach me, teach me to be more like Christ. The third and final petition that I want to draw your attention to in Psalm 86 is found in verses 14 down through verse 17. And I want you to read with me these verses and notice David's petition for strength. Notice what David says, verse 14, we get a description of the problem that David is facing, the hardship that David is dealing with. He says, oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life and they do not set you before them. Now, before we read the rest of the Psalm, let's just put this in a little bit of a, of a context. As in so many other cases, this, this Psalm is being written in a time of trial and trouble. This trouble that David is facing is coming as the result of people. They are insolent men. They are rising up against him. David says they are not people that follow God. They are his enemies. They are trying to push against David. They are trying to impose their will on David, and they are uprising against him. And this could have taken a lot of different forms. We don't know exactly, but it could have been war. It could have been plotting against him. It could have been slandering the name of David. We don't know what the particulars are, but what we do know is David was facing this trial from people, from the hands of insolent and ruthless men. But notice the contrast in verse 15. Remember where we started, by the way, before we look at verse 15. Remember all the way back in the beginning that David said, I am poor and needy. I am weak. I am in this moment of weakness. Men are coming against me. I'm vulnerable. I feel like I'm being attacked. Notice verse now, now verse 15, but you, O Lord, are a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Notice that cry again that David, back in verse 5, talking about God's forgiveness and God's faithfulness, that God had shown himself to be faithful in the past. Now verse 16, turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. And save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me. And notice that last phrase, and comforted me. In this time of trial, David makes this final petition to a merciful, compassionate, long-tempered, and gracious God because he understood God's faithfulness. He understood that God had been faithful to him in the past and that God would be faithful to him once again. And this final petition is so important. In the beginning, David recognizes, recognizes his humanity, his weakness, his vulnerability. He recognizes his need for mercy and grace he recognizes his need for instruction, and he also understands his need for divine strength. I say this often because I think it's so prevalent in our culture, even in our Christian culture, that it needs to be corrected. People will say, well, you know, God doesn't give us more than we can handle. That just isn't true. God does give us more than we can handle because in those moments, one of the things he is teaching us is to rely on his strength and not ours. I've been meeting uh, off and on with a group of men who have been getting together in a virtual prayer time. And we this week had a, a time of prayer. And as I hear each man share what is going on in their heart, some are missionaries serving in other countries, and I hear what is going on with them, and there is this repetitive refrain that we all are 
out of our own strength. We don't know the answers. We don't know where to go. We don't have the ability, the strength to do this on our own power. And to that, I say, amen for the grace of God. Because how often do we parent in our own strength? Do we lead in our own strength? Do we work in our own strength? Are we a husband or wife in our own strength? How often do we rely on ourselves? And in this moment of David's weakness and neediness, he readily recognized, God, I need your strength. We seek strength from a lot of places. Maybe it's your favorite TV talk show. Maybe it's your favorite radio host. Or maybe it's your best friend that you get together for coffee with once a week. Whoever that may be, unfortunately, we are very slow and stubborn when it comes to taking our requests for strength before the throne of grace and to the one who can truly give us the strength, and that is God himself. Sometimes we fear when we fear when we feel helpless we choose fear we choose hopelessness and we choose complaining I got an email this week from a friend who um I used used to be a part of our church he's no longer here um, in, in Wilmington any longer. And he emailed me uh, this week. I hadn't heard from him in a while. And he said, I made a statement a few years ago that, that made him mad. He said, Jay, you said once in a sermon that when troubles happen and I begin to despair and to complain, that that was my choice. I was choosing to complain. I was choosing to despair. And he said, that comment infuriated me. He said, but recently I have been feeling depleted. I've been feeling weak. And he said, recently my mind was going down this road of despair and my weakness. I was going down a road of complaining. And he said, that statement came to my mind. And he said, I am choosing right now to trust in the Lord and rest in his strength. To my friend, maybe you're watching you know who you are? I say this, I'm glad I made you mad. I'm glad that statement got your attention. And maybe maybe that statement is getting your attention today, that sometimes when we are out of strength, what we do is we run to complaining, we run to despair, we run to all these places that make us somehow feel better when in reality we are to run to the throne of our heavenly father. He is the source of strength. Before we close, I want to leave you on this, on this note, talking about where we find strength from. Let me give you four quick lessons that I, I hope we all will learn. Number one, believers should never be whiners. Let me say that again. Believers should never be whiners. They shouldn't be complainers. How many Christians do you know, even right now, are filled with whining and complaining? That tells me that they're not going to the Lord for strength. They're not resting in the Lord. They're not trusting in the Lord. They are somehow feeling better by complaining. Believers should never be whiners. Number two, no one owes you anything. We sometimes wrongly believe that this world owes us something that our boss owes us something, or the governor owes us something, owes us something, or the president owes us something. Nobody owes, owes us anything. We have to rest in the fact we are just servants of God. We are servants of the Lord. We are not here, brings me to my third uh, lesson, is it's all about God. It's not about you. God is going to be glorified through this time in American history. Some writers are saying this could lead to the next great awakening in our nation. That would be a wonderful thing. It's about God. It's not about you. Then the fourth and final lesson that I I want you to learn from this final section of this psalm is ultimate strength is found in God alone, not in people. Listen to two verses of scripture, Psalm 138, verse three. I love this, by the way. Psalm 138, verse 3, on the day I called, 
you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. I love that. While, we were, while I was waiting, while the music team was leading us in worship, I was waiting my, my turn to speak with you today. Someone called me. I don't know who you were. I don't know who it was. But I, I sent it to voicemail. I ignored the call. But here it says, on the day I called, the psalmist says, you answered me. And God, you strengthened my soul. My strength of soul increased. And then Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. My friend, you know how many steps it is dangerous to take without depending on God? The answer is one. Even one step, not depending on the strength and mercy and grace of God is one too many. I hope this psalm will highlight for you three petitions that we all should be making. We should be pleading to the Lord and making petition to the Lord for grace and mercy. I needed grace for salvation. I needed his mercy for redemption, but I also needed each and every day of my life. We also should be making this consistent petition. Lord, teach me. What are you teaching me in these moments? And then finally, making this petition, Lord, strengthen me. You may be feeling weak and worn down right now. This may be wearing on your soul. Your soul may be almost on the verge of despair. You may feel like your life is collapsing around you. Let me just remind you that the Lord will bring joy to your soul. He may not take away your hardship tomorrow. He may not take away the circumstances tomorrow, but he will give you joy in the midst of your trial and he will teach you and he will give you strength. Don't trust in yourself, rest in the Lord. So in your times of weakness and need, seek the Lord with all of your heart and boldly bring these three petitions to him. And your gracious, merciful, forgiving Heavenly Father will be there waiting to hear you and to answer you. And as Psalm 138 says, to strengthen your soul. I'm going to end our time today with a word of prayer. And I want to just thank you for being with us today. And if you have questions about salvation, if you have questions about what we talked about today, please reach out to us. You can go to our website, gracenc.org. There's a contact button there. You can, you can email us and we will be glad to answer any questions that you may have about what it means to be a Christian, about what it means to experience the redemption that Jesus offers. We would love to talk with you. If you are a believer and you want someone to pray for you, there's something that we can pray for you about. Please also feel free to contact us. We would love to be in prayer for you. Thank you again for joining us. And so let's close today our time together with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. We need it each and every day. And that your grace is abundant and your mercy is always readily available to us in our times of need. Lord, we thank you that you do instruct us as we go through this life it's to be uh, your, uh, help us to be living as servants and living uh, obediently to you and learning more and more about you as we go through our daily lives. And Lord, we do beseech you, God, give us strength. Give us the strength that we need, not strength that would be in people or in, in things of this world, but rather strength that is supernatural and that it is found only at the foot of the cross, only found before your throne. And Lord, strengthen our hearts today. Encourage those that need it. Strengthen those that feel worn down and feel discouraged today. And God, I pray that you would gladden our souls and give us joy knowing that you love us and you forever will forgive us and you will one day come again and we will see you face to face. And we rest in those promises and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.